Thank you. Um, sorry for the delay, and thank you, Chair Murray and Ranking Member Braun this morning. Um, and thank you to all of our witnesses for being here. Uh, first question uh, to you, Mr. Pierce. We have to protect the rights of workers to organize and collectively bargain. So-called right-to-work legislation has been passed into law in a number of states, and there are ongoing efforts to pass these bills in other states, including my home state of New Hampshire. We know that these so-called right-to-work laws are actually right-to-work for less laws, making it significantly more difficult for workers to form unions and resulting in lower wages, more dangerous working conditions, and less access to health care and other benefits. So, Mr. Pierce, can you explain what Congress can do to address this and help workers collectively bargain? <laughs> Thank you for the question. I'm so eager that I didn't turn on my... Um, uh, well, the PRO Act deals directly with the question of right-to-work laws. They, they eliminate that from the National Labor Relations Act. The right-to-work law exists because it was part of those compromises that were made in the, for the passage of the National Labor Relations Act, and it has an insidious past. Right-to-work laws emanated from legislation that was assisted insisted by uh, Southern senators in order to substantially control people of color in the South from being able to join and, and enjoy the benefits of unionization. Those vestiges of, of uh, slavery adjacent uh, processes need to be rem removed, otherwise, you have situations where a union is trying to effectively uh, represent employees, including employees that do not have to pay a dime towards the, those services, yet the union would have to have a duty under the law to zealously represent irrespective of how expensive the process is. That has to change. Thank you. Uh, another question for you. The COVID-19 pandemic presented new health and safety challenges for workers all across the country and highlighted widespread inequities. The pandemic has also made it more difficult for workers to gather and discuss challenges that they face in the workplace. So how can Congress help address worker inequities that the pandemic exacerbated? Well, the, the PRO Act provides opportunities for workers to be able to unionize more, more freely. Um, those oppositions to unionization uh, impacts workers' ability to be able to deal with things like the pandemic. As I stated in, in, in my opening, it's because of many unions being present at a facility that protections were brought in, uh, exposures uh, to, to bad policies and vulnerabilities were made public as a re result of union in intervention. The PRO Act's provisions will provide that kind of protection for employees. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shareholds. I have a question for you. We know that when workers organize, it can result in better working conditions and benefits across the board. This can be particularly meaningful for women whose earnings continue to lag behind their male counterparts. So can you talk about how expanding the rights of workers to organize will support women in the workforce, including helping them close the gender pay gap and increase retirement savings? Yeah, that's an important, that's a really important point. And I talked a little bit about this, but I think what, what unions do is that they raise wages for workers by allowing workers to join together with, your, with their colleagues in a union and collectively bargain. We see higher wages, that women, women in unions have higher wages than similar women who aren't in unions, better benefits, better working conditions. And then I, I, I mentioned this, but I'll just say it again because it's so worth repeating, this idea that the, the point that workers in unions have better schedules. They have better, they have more control over their schedules. They have more advanced notice over their schedules. And so what that means is that people, predominantly women in the society who have care responsibilities, have more predictability in their job, and that makes their lives, their working lives, much more possible. And when they earn more, too, they can save more for retirement, right? In, well put, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, last question for Mrs. Heldman. Many workers aren't aware of the rights that they have in the workplace, including laws that protect the rights of workers to organize. 
you have tirelessly worked to collectively organize your workplace. Do you think workers need to have greater access to information about their right to organize under the law? You need to. Yes, they do. And um, I mean, when we try to organize, they always really go out there and they, some of these people do not know their rights to organize. So they intimidate them and they followed you around and they take you to these captive meetings and as you're walking into the captive meetings, they're yelling, vote no, vote no at the top of their lungs. That's our supervisors. And they sit up there and they say, vote no. And you go out on the floor and they follow you around, they still intimidate you and they tell this um, co-workers of mine, they say, if you vote yes for the union, you're gonna get fired, you know? Um, and some of these people don't really know their rights, you know, and, and they lie to them about the union and they lie to them about everything and that's why we haven't won our union elections. If not, we would have had it 20 years ago. We would have won our first one. Thank you very much and thank you, Madam Chair, for your indulgence. Thank you, Senator Tupperville. Thank you, Madam Chair. 